Mind Wings Audio presents Scrap Metal and Murder by Wayne Zero. Read by David Kolachi. Ned's Bucket of Blood. The name suggested a real class joint. The Bucket, a typical southern roadhouse, sat on a secondary highway about 50 feet off the blacktop in a dog eared neighborhood. Large clumps of Dallas grass dotted the gravel parking lot, and a bumper crop of ragweed grew along the exterior walls of the bar. A half dozen vehicles, four of them pickup trucks, were scattered around the lot in no particular order. I parked near the door and walked in. The smell of stale beer and old cigarette smoke could have gagged a maggot. The occupants of those six parked vehicles perched on stools and lounged at tables throughout the dingy gin mill. A not-quite-pretty blonde in a short black dress sang her rendition of It Takes Balls to Be a Woman. Her guitarist wore a fancy two-tone cowboy shirt and looked vaguely like Stephen King, if Steve hadn't washed his hair in a decade. I took a stool at the close end of the bar. "'What'll you have?' the bartender asked as he dropped the stained coaster in front of me. I placed him somewhere between forty and sixty, broad and short with a crew cut and a walrus mustache. From the twists of his nose you could count the number of times it had been broken. His teeth were stained yellow, as were two fingers of his right hand. He might have single-handedly accounted for the nicotine stink inside the bucket of blood. What do you have on tap? I asked. Bud. That's it? I gave him a friendly smile. Uh huh. He didn't return the smile. How about in the bottle? Bud Light. And more, Bud. A company man, huh? I managed another smile. Do what? Still the same blank expression from him. So far, a tip was out of the question. I'll have a pint of bud. Don't got no pints. Okay, make it easy on yourself. I grew tired of our erudite debate. He took three steps to the tap handle and came back with a twelve-ounce mug. The beer was cold and fresh. The bartender went to check on his other customers, and I looked over the room. It probably wasn't the worst place I'd ever seen, but it made my bottom ten. As the blonde ended her song, the barman walked back toward me, drying a glass. "'Are you Ned?' I asked. "'Nope, I'm Jake. Ned won't be here till maybe eight thirty, nine o'clock. "'Got a few minutes to talk?' Ain't exactly got a crowd taking up my time, he said. I need some information. My statement caused a wrinkle on his brow and a general look of distrust to alter his expression. You the police or something? Or something, I said, and showed him my badge. You know a guy named Melvin Kite? I understand he comes here. Melvin Kite? Hmm, not sure. Jake's mama taught him to play hard to get. How much is that beer? I asked. Two fifty. I took a twenty from the folded water cash in my pocket and placed it on the bar. I grinned and said, I guess you could keep the change if you knew something about this Melvin Kite guy. Jake liked that idea. Finally, his turn to smile. Melvin Kite, Melvin Kite, he said. Sounds familiar now. He a short, stocky guy with a scar on his chin. Sounds like my man, but the picture of him I saw was almost five years old. I know him, Jake said. What's he done? I'm not sure he's done anything, I lied. Someone reported a hit and run and gave his plate number. I need to find him and straighten that business out. 
Why don't you go to his home? Jake was a practical thinker. All the addresses I can find are old. Melvin moves around a lot. Comes in here some, Jake said. Especially when they's live music. I expect he'll be here tonight to see Marla. Scrap Metal and Murder. Copyright 2009 by Wayne Zerl. Audio production copyright 2010 by Mind Wings Audio. All rights reserved. We hope you enjoyed listening to this recording. Discover more one-hour audiobooks from Mind Wings Audio.